Oh, and welcome back. This is a lecture on chapter four, which is really, uh, I think, one of the most fascinating chapters so far in this book. I mean, this is really riveting stuff. It's uh, it's about communicating across cultures, and we'll be talking about all sorts of ways you can conceptualize, prepare, strategize uh, for, you know, communicating with everyone that's uh, from China, India. Uh, how is that different uh, than uh, communicating with someone from Canada? Uh, so we're really going to get into these topics. And I'll, I'll just say, that though, uh, starting out here, if this is something that really interests you, uh, we have whole courses at St. Cloud State uh, dedicated just to this topic, uh, intercultural communication. And we also have a robust uh, study abroad program. And I highly encourage you uh, to look into that. I'll see if I can find the links to it, but you can just go to a, 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 the a university website, look for a study abroad and see all those opportunities. We're kind of, <laughs> you know, think I'll say it's kind of known for this. And so it's really worth looking into, give you some invaluable experience. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, uh, let's get into this. All right, here are the learning objectives for today. Notice we've only got four this time. Well, that's a good thing. We're talking about cultural intelligence, uh, cultural uh, or CQ now instead of the uh, we talked about the uh, emotional quotient last time emotional intelligence so we'll be I guess expanding that concept into uh, a cultural uh, cultural aspects of it now uh, we're talking about uh, the cultural dimensions uh, axes you could use to compare cultures uh, the key categories of business etiquette in the intercultural communication process. <laughs> You're going to find that there's uh, quite a few major differences in everything from uh, what you do when you sit down for dinner uh, to uh, handshakes, ways to handle uh, business cards. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, big differences when you go uh, to other countries. Also uh, identify how generational uh, age, basically, uh, generation Z, Y, etc. Uh, gender in other countries and uh, other sorts of group differences, how all this plays into the workplace communication. So good stuff. And here's uh, how we'll be going about this. We'll talk about cultural intelligence first, uh, then we'll get into these dimensions I was talking about, individualism versus collectivism, egalitarianism versus hi and hierarchy, assertiveness, performance orientation or PO, future orientation or FO, humane orientation, or maybe we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to make an acronym out of that one. I don't know. And uncertainty, avoidance, and gender egalitarianism. So quite a bit. And then we got these categories of business etiquette, uh, appropriate topics, conversation. Uh, you might think that's universal, but it's really not. Uh, you have to be careful. Uh, yeah, you have taboo topics, things you should not discuss. Uh, punctuality in meetings, how important is that? Uh, you might think that it's important to be on time in every country, but um, every culture, but there's actually quite a bit of uh, differences there, quite a few. Uh, dining, we mentioned that already. Uh, even touching and proximity uh, vary among cultures. Uh, we'll get into that. And then uh, how all this ties into the topic of the course, the, of course, the uh, workplace communication. All right, so let's get started with this uh, notion of cultural intelligence or CQ, cultural intelligence quotient. Uh, what is that? It's a measure of your ability to work with and adapt to members of other cultures. It's, it is like uh, the EQ that we talked about before, but this, um, or uh, I guess I should say it's not <laughs> like IQ. <laughs> Uh, most people think your IQ is just sort of set, sort of a genetic thing, I suppose. So that, you know, other people have challenged that and say that there's <laughs> social environmental factors involved. But anyway, uh, like the EQ, the CQ is something you can train uh, yourself to get better at or get a higher uh, cultural intelligence score. Uh, let's talk about what culture is. Uh, what do we mean when we say culture? <laughs> How is that different than society, uh, for example? Uh, well, this is a combination of things, and you can certainly find different definitions of culture if you take a, a cultural studies course. It's kind of a, it's about as hard to define culture as it, as it is to define rhetoric. <laughs> a lot of different definitions out there. Uh, but anyway, this is a good one. It includes the shared values, uh, the norms, uh, rules, everything from etiquette to uh, 
gender relations and so on. Uh, behaviors of an identifiable, an identifiable group of people who share a common history and communication system. Uh, so this, you know, these could change, right? It doesn't, it doesn't sound like this is, um, you know, saying these cultures are rigid and inflexible. Uh, the main thing, though, is you can you can point to a group and say this group has all this stuff in common. They share this history. They have this uh, shared norms, values, rules, and etc. Now, there are many types of uh, culture, a national culture. You know, think about what it means to be an American versus a Canadian, for example. In a lot of ways, the same, but uh, some key differences, right? And there's also organizational cultures, which we've talked about before. And even uh, down to the team, the really local team you're working with will have a, a culture. So you can think about St. Cloud State, for example, has a culture. Right? We have a set of shared values, a history, uh, ways of communicating, uh, <laughs> behaviors. <laughs> you know, people can point to us and say, those are Huskies over there, and they're different than uh, uh, Mankato, for example. So lots of different ways to think about culture. Now, what about cultural intelligence in the workplace? Uh, we start here by talking about what it means to have a high cultural intelligence. <laughs> somebody who has taken courses in uh, intercultural communication, somebody who's really savvy with these things. What are the benefits? Uh, well, um, first, you respect, recognize, and appreciate cultural differences. Uh, so you're not one of those xenophobic types that <laughs> you know, doesn't want to work with somebody. Uh, just because they come from another country. You know, quite the opposite, you, you welcome that, you embrace that, and you really see it as an opportunity. Uh, I'm often coming across students who, uh, you know, as an advisor, and sometimes they'll be honest about it, sometimes they'll kind of uh, try to hedge on it, but basically they don't want to take courses from professors from other countries or with, uh, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, last names because they say they have a hard time understanding that person's accent. Uh, they don't. They, they want to study with somebody that's just like uh, they are. You know, I say that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you, you can uh, learn. You can. Uh, it doesn't take very long to, uh, you know, get better at interpreting somebody's accent. Uh, that's trivial, and you'll be missing out on some really, uh, you know, key differences. And you're kind of keeping it. You're, you're kind of closing your mind. Uh, when you're doing that. So try to, you know, if that describes you, you know, try to reverse this, try to think of more, uh, try to be more positive about it. Uh, don't get hung up on some kind of negative uh, attitude. And instead, yeah, do this. <laughs> Respect, recognize, appreciate the cultural differences. A lot of accents are beautiful things. It's not just about uh, being hard to understand. Uh, possess curiosity about and interest in other cultures. So another just kind of an attitude adjustment is <laughs> required sometimes. <laughs> so don't feel like you know all about this other culture. Uh, instead, adopt that learner mindset. Avoid the inappropriate stereotypes. Uh, that should go without saying, but of course, uh, some of these can linger on and on. And keep in mind, too, that other people, other cultures have stereotypes about you, about Americans or about <laughs> Minnesotans. And so you don't like that, uh, so you, you shouldn't, um, you know, impose those on other people. Uh, adjust conceptions of time and show patience. Uh, we'll get into this when we start talking about uh, punctuality differences. Uh, manage the language differences to achieve a shared meaning. So I was kind of touching on that earlier with, with the accents, right? Uh, this could be, uh, you know, going somewhere where they don't speak English. You know, how do you handle that situation? Uh, we'll get into this. Uh, understanding these those dimensions, establishing trust, showing empathy across cultures, uh, approach cross country uh, cross cultural work relationships with a learner mindset. Right, so you're not there to <laughs> assimilate <laughs> uh, the people there, the employees in that branch. Uh, quite the opposite, you're there to create a cross cultural relationship with them, not a, uh, a dominant. <laughs> relationship or some kind of a colonial <laughs> uh, or imperialist hegemony, right? This is uh, learning to work with, appreciate the differences. Uh, building a co-culture of cooperation and innovation. A co-culture, -co co <laughs> a little tricky to say. Uh, but anyway, these are all the characteristics of the high cultural intelligence, basically where you want to end up.
after you've taken all these courses and maybe studied abroad, uh, you will develop some of these uh, characteristics. Now, cultural intelligence is built on attitudes of respect and recognition of other cultures. So what does that mean? You view other cultures as holding, holding legitimate and valid views of and approaches to managing business and workplace relationships. And so you can imagine the, um, you know, the, the book talked about how in, in Mexico, um, various uh, South American countries, they have very different attitudes, very different uh, norms, I guess, around, say, punctuality, uh, things of that sort. And so the key is not to see that and say, well, that's just because they're less developed. Or that, and they're just not as advanced as, as I am, my culture is. You, you want to come away from that attitude and instead uh, just see it as, as, yeah, that might be different, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's inferior uh, somehow. You know, it's not really about being superior or inferior. <laughs> it's about uh, respecting and recognizing those differences. And we'll say there's good reason uh, to do so. It's actually more advantageous economically speaking, uh, to see it that way instead of feeling like you need to uh, impose your way on these other cultures. A lot of times you end up erasing uh, the differences that might have uh, turned out to be very uh, beneficial to you in your company. Now, what is diversity? Uh, diversity is the presence of many cultural groups in the workplace. And we talked about all kinds of different there's different kinds of diversity. It's not just language or uh, country of origin. There's many different <laughs> types of diversity. Uh, but these uh, the business professionals with a high uh, cultural intelligence uh, embrace it. You know, they see this as, they, even, they go so far here as to call it a moral imperative, the means to achieve a higher performance. Uh, so again, the goal is not to have everybody that looks alike, sort of a one-size-fits-all, homogenous, <laughs> you, know, you know, drones who all uh, are exactly the same. You know, it's it's quite the opposite. And I always think about the show, if you ever watch Star Trek, um, I, I grew up watching that one, The Next Generation, <laughs> but even on the, the first show, <laughs> uh, you saw that they, they really made a key point about not having just all... Uh, in that case, uh, not just all humans on the bridge crew, right? They had Klingon and, and uh, who else did they have there? Uh, an android. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm kind of it's kind of a little bit, you know, it's science fiction, sure, uh, but that shows a good example of how those, you know, oftentimes uh, the characters that had, you know, if they didn't have that diversity on the bridge crew, they wouldn't be able to solve problems. And so it's just it's kind of a fictional way to get into this, but it's it's the same in real life as well. You know, the more diverse the crew, uh, the more perspectives you have, uh, the better able you are to solve problems. Uh, be curious about other cultures. Well, we've talked about this study abroad. It's one of my biggest regrets in life. I did not take advantage when I was in college of all the study abroad opportunities that were there. Uh, very foolish. You know, and I really hope, I know some of you have already done this, uh, but if you haven't or if you're scared about it or you don't know how to get started, uh, just remember we have a study abroad program here. Uh, you can go study somewhere for a semester, maybe a couple weeks in the summer. Uh, we have a castle <laughs> in England. <laughs> you can go, I mean, how awesome is that? You can go study in a castle. Wow. You know, I'm kind of <laughs> maybe I should look into teaching uh, there. I wonder if they, if they would have me. Uh, but even if it's just taking a trip, you know, take one of these. Uh, sometimes you'll see around campus these flyers of uh, student uh, trips somewhere. You know, great opportunity to go to uh, South America. Uh, even just going to Canada, you know, <laughs> that's not out of the range of possibility, right? It's <laughs> not that far uh, to go to Canada uh, from Minnesota, and it might see. Well, what could I learn? It's Surely it's not that different uh, than it is in the, in the U.S. And I just say, you'd be surprised. You know, you'd be surprised. Uh, so go to Canada uh, this summer, maybe. Uh, spend a few weeks, or at least a week. <laughs> at least you can say you had some international experience. Uh, learning a language, you know, this is a lot of times where I think Americans just really fall flat. Uh, any, Almost all my international students will say, you know, they know maybe two languages, but maybe they they might know three or four. You know, I got a student this semester that says he knows uh, six languages. You know, I don't doubt it. Uh, but, but, but if it's just the one language, uh, that's better than just uh, 
I mean, uh, just studying one language is better than none. Uh, so I, again, encourage you, do what you can. It's not easy uh, to learn a language from a book uh, or just taking a class. You know, you really need to tie this into the uh, studying abroad, be immersed in the language. But anything you can do, even a basic understanding is better than nothing. Uh, yes, friendships with international students on your campus. You know, this is a wonderful thing about St. Cloud State. We have so many international students. And uh, a lot of times these students, are they, they get lonely, right? There's, nobody uh, wants to talk to them. Uh, they just, maybe they only, uh, uh, their only network is other international students. And I mean, that's a real shame. Uh, really, uh, you know, do what you can. If you if you have international students in your class, get to know them, right? Hello, hi, <laughs> where are you from? <laughs> you know, develop these friendships and that can really, it's not, not only is it just fun to have a, you know, friends from other countries, but you can learn a lot and that'll be useful to you later in life. And this is one thing I did do uh, in college. I got to, anytime I could possibly do this, I, I got to know people from uh, Russia and Germany and uh, let's see where else a lot of uh, a lot of Puerto Rican friends of course <laughs> uh, Cuban friends uh, I had a friends from Greece you know just just any of them that I could uh, get to know them and I never had a problem with them saying I don't want to hang out with you <laughs> you know you're a little too different or something you know wasn't anything like that uh, just really great friendships and uh, some of those I've maintained in my I got friends from India uh, that I st I'm still friends with all these years later on Facebook. So uh, take the time. It doesn't take much to get started with that, and it'll pay off. Uh, take an interest in culture and routinely learn about it. Yeah, so if you see a course, a book, a video, you know, anything, again, <laughs> most people probably won't bother to do even that. So you're already a step above if you've read some books about another culture. Let's see, take an interest in culture, routinely learn yeah, films, television, documentaries, news. You know, this is really easy these days with Netflix. Uh, you can see all these, uh, I think they have a foreign film section with subtitles. You can certainly watch those. And, uh, be entertained, but also be subtly uh, learning about these uh, other cultures. Uh, documentaries about the cultures. There's a really great, if you like Monty Python, uh, there's a really great series. They're kind of old now, but I think they're still worth watching. It's uh, uh, Michael Palin one of the pythons. He's got these wonderful travel documentaries and uh, just really great stuff. I think Chef Gordon Ramsay does some of these as well. And, uh, who's that? There's a chef uh, uh, recently passed away, but he had some good documentaries like that. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, I'm wanting to say. Bourdain? <laughs> Not quite sure how to pronounce his last name, but uh, you can look those up. Uh, of course, news about other countries, other videos, other culture. Uh, the business culture of a country, and they mentioned some of these, a lot of the uh, business uh, news sites will cover this, uh, CNBC, for example. Uh, of course, taking courses, attending events, you know, and this, this attend events, again, St. Cloud State is known for this. You know, we have uh, all these nights, they call them, uh, like Malaysia night, uh, Chinese uh, I forget the Chinese. Uh, there's there's one about a there's a festival, Chinese festival that's uh, represented on campus, and I've gone to several of these just as a professor to see what's going on, and they're really amazing. <laughs> you can really just uh, get immersed in this, and there's such a positive vibe uh, at these events. Uh, so definitely go to those. You might think, oh, it's just one night. Uh, what can I possibly learn? Just going to one event. Uh, but hey, <laughs> you'd really be surprised. Especially if you, uh, you know, go a step further and start making some friends there. Yeah, make friends with the people who live in other cultures, and then uh, after they go back to their their culture, if they do, uh, you, that doesn't mean you can't communicate with them anymore. You know, you can be friends with them on Facebook. You know, I've got uh, some some of my former students uh, for, are from Saudi Arabia, and they friended me on Facebook after the class, and you know, I really enjoy. Uh, seeing what they're up to, <laughs> you know, it's just fun to have uh, connections to, uh, to folks in places that are very different uh, than what you're accustomed to. Okay, uh, the inappropriate stereotypes. Uh, we'll talk about two different kinds, uh, the projected cognitive similarity and the outgroup homogeneity effect. 
And a projective cognitive similarity is you just you assume other people have the same norms as values as your own cultural group. Uh, so you basically think that no matter where you go, everybody's basically the same. And of course, that's wrong. Uh, the other one is uh, the tendency to think members of other groups are all the same. So you say things like, well, uh, Mexicans are all like this, right? Or, or let's talk about Canadians. Canadians are fill in the blank. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of diversity in those countries. <laughs> you know, the Mexican people are just as diverse as American people, uh, etc. So it doesn't make much sense to try to uh, assume that they're all hom homogenous <laughs> or that they're all the same. Uh, so these are two inappropriate stereotypes and you know, I think probably to some extent we can't help but uh, practice these from time to time. Uh, but the goal is to try your best to eradicate this, uh, not to feel that way or think that way as much as possible. Let's see, perceptions that members of various cultures have about Americans. Well, let's see, so apparently Canadians <laughs> or a percentage of Canadians uh, think that we're hardworking. All right, that's good. Uh, inventive, uh, that's good. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> honest, not so much. Oh, uh, greedy. Wow. Uh, so there's a sizable chunk of Canadians, I suppose, that think we're dishonest and greedy and rude. Uh, let's see, China uh, doesn't think we're very hardworking. I seem to recall some Chinese ambassador or governor, prime minister. I guess it's probably been decades ago now, but I remember there was a big kerfuffle uh, when this official said that Americans were lazy. And all the all the pundits were upset about that. <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> you know, when they were talking about the Chinese uh, students and how many hours they go to school and how few breaks they get and how hard they study. And I have to say, if you go to the library or the Miller Center here on campus and, and see what students are there studying, <laughs> chances are it's almost all the international students are there studying and you won't see, uh, you know, very many uh, Minnesotan born uh, students in there uh, at all. Uh, uh, let's see, inventive, honest, ooh, <laughs> okay, I better get off this, this chart here. This is kind of getting me upset, uh, but you can see um, how the stereotypes, a lot of times we think about our stereotypes of other people, uh, but it's very useful, very enlightening to flip the table and, and think about their stereotypes of us or Americans. And you can start to understand why this is a problem, <laughs> why this is problematic. Uh, adjusting your conceptions of time. Uh, so people high in CQ show patience for these things. Um, most tasks take longer when working across cultures because more time is needed to understand one another and, and to cooperate effectively. Right, because you're having to mitigate the, not just language, but all these uh, other aspects. Oh, let's see, manage language differences. Uh, avoid quickly judging others, uh, judging that others have limited communication proficiency. All right, so this is a, you know, you ask a question, uh, you don't get an immediate response or seems to be taking the person a while to uh, articulate something, uh, that's not a sign that the person doesn't know the language or that they're, you know, they're struggling uh, with commun basic communication skills. Uh, it could just be they need more time. Now, articulate uh, clearly and slow down. And you, uh, if you do study another language, you'll notice You'll, you'll know this. It's really nice when people can do this. You know, don't, don't speak so quickly. I'm, I'm still learning the language, you know, slow down, uh, articulate uh, more clearly, and then you'll be able to understand, uh, especially if you're still learning the language. Uh, if, you sp if somebody's speaking really quickly, uh, you can't follow. Slang and jargon should be avoided for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, you go to other countries and they don't know anything about football, for example. Uh, you know, football in those other countries probably means soccer. Totally different sport even. And so be careful, especially with those sports metaphors. Uh, give others time to express themselves. We kind of covered that one already. You know, if, uh, it might take longer. You know, as a teacher, uh, it might take longer to write an essay if English isn't your first language. 
and that's fine. You know, chances are it'll turn out beautifully in the end. I just you want to have some uh, extra time in there to compensate for the uh, the language. Uh, use interpreters as necessary. Uh, so sometimes you need somebody in there to interpret for you. And I've I've had one experience with this. I gave a talk one time in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. <laughs> they had an interpreter there, and it was it was really it's the first time, first and only time I've had that experience, and I have to say it was very uh, uh, distracting to me. You know, I could see it would take a lot of practice to get used to this uh, this idea. Uh, so cut somebody some slack. <laughs> you know, if they're going through an interpreter, uh, keep in mind it's probably not uh, you know extremely comfortable for them either. Uh, so again, being patient, uh, taking the time will be very advantageous to everybody. All right, now we're getting into cultural dimensions, and we don't want to get you know, take this concept too far because then we'll get into stereotypes, right? I start thinking of cultures as being solid and uh, unchanging. Uh, but that's not to say there aren't fairly permanent and enduring sets of related norms and values. So we're kind of hedging a little bit here because there are things uh, that we can say with some, you know, statistical uh, probability <laughs> are the case despite the, you know, of course, all the uh, diversity within the cultures. I mean, we, we don't want to go, we don't, you know, sometimes I get students to say, well, everybody is unique, you know, and everybody is, is uh, completely different in every possible way from the person next to them. And of course, that's wrong too, <laughs> you know, but somewhere in between that um, idea and the complete stereotypes, uh, there's, there's a, uh, this, these ideas, right? The cultural dimensions. And let's we'll, we'll take them all, but uh, here's a nice little table you can see up front. And individuals, collectivism, egalitarianism, performance, POFO, assertiveness, humane orientation. Now let's just let's just get into each one. <laughs> okay, individualism uh, versus collectivism. So you've probably heard of this before. Um, Americans tend to be more uh, individualistic uh, than Chinese uh, cultures, for example. Uh, what does that mean uh, to say that? Well, they're talking about this concept of individualism, and they define it here. Let's see, what do they say it is? A mindset that prioritizes independence more highly than interdependence, emphasizing individual goals over group goals, and valuing choice more than obligation. And so you might think, you know, one of the ways I see this expressed with students is over uh, group projects, collaborative projects. And a lot of times uh, the, U the American students will say, I don't want to take, I don't want that group project. You know, I, I don't want to be responsible or I don't, I don't want to have to share responsibility. I just want to do my own work and, you know, pursue my own goals. And then you might have uh, students, uh, the international students, though, might have a totally different attitude. They might vastly prefer uh, the group projects. You know, I've, I've, so I've uh, witnessed this, and if you've taught before, you probably have seen the same thing. So there is some truth to this. Yeah, of course, the uh, the other poll would be the collectivist. And so this is the mindset that prioritizes uh, interdependence over independence, group goals over individual goals, obligations uh, more than choice. And you can see how this breaks down. So it looks like Japan. On this uh, on this table is at the top collectivism and organizations, and then uh, Italy on the bottom. Let's see where's and there's the USA somewhere in the middle. So I guess we're sort of <laughs> in the middle. And they didn't mention that if you go to different regions in the U.S., like the where I'm from, the Deep South, there's it's more of a collectivist mindset. And you know I, I can see this. There's a lot more people there working for the same company uh, their entire lives. Kind of have a more of a almost a family view, like this company should take care of me and I should uh, just be, I should be loyal to the company uh, versus uh, somewhere up north, I suppose. <laughs> There's like, you know, you're kind of expected to uh, switch jobs several times. And here's some uh, old table here of communication practices in these uh, individualist versus collectivist cultures. Uh, so you can see here some tips like if you're dealing with a highly individual cultural, you could, uh, culture, you can in, uh, discuss individual rewards and goals uh, versus in this other one, 
how you'd want to talk about group, like this will be good for your team or this whole department will get a reward uh, that would carry more weight than just individuals. You know, just thinking uh, again about <laughs> universities kind of fit more into this collectivist model. Uh, I, you know, especially with the, like uh, St. Cloud State, we have a faculty union uh, that represents faculty. I don't think that's, uh, that's not uncommon. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of times uh, professors are willing to undergo or willing to abandon or uh, what's the word, forego, uh, say, individual raises, promotions uh, for the sake of uh, protecting everybody else. So this is a lot of times I'll say we would rather not have a raise uh, than to have uh, somebody get laid off, uh, for example. So I'd say that's probably a little, a little more on the collectivist side of the spectrum. Uh, than the individual. Okay, egalitarianism in hierarchy. Uh, so the egalitarians, uh, people tend to distribute share power evenly, minimize those status differences, uh, special privileges and opportunities for people <laughs> just because they have a higher authority uh, versus the hierarchical cultures, which would be, I guess, the opposite. Yeah, so people expecting uh, power differences, uh, they say follow leaders without questioning them. I mean, I don't know if that's <laughs> ever been possible <laughs> or ever been the case with any leader, but uh, at least not as common. Uh, feel comfortable with leaders receiving special privileges and opportunities. And so you can see the, it looks like South Korea tops this chart uh, with the Netherlands at the bottom. And the USA is, is fairly low on this. Uh, so I guess the idea is we don't like uh, rank and privilege <laughs> as much as other countries do. Let's see, communication practices in egalitarian and hierarchical cultures. Uh, Decision-making is more decentralized. As I've had uh, you know, some business students who were, did some research on uh, some, some of these different models and uh, of business communication and, and leadership. And uh, one of the things that's kind of popular now is uh, you don't want anybody, any employee, no matter how, where they are on the org chart, uh, everybody should have some say in every decision, especially if it impacts them. Uh, that's sort of the trend, which I guess would be more towards egalitarianism uh, versus a hierarchy where that, yes, that manager just makes the decision, that's it. Everybody else just has to roll with it. And I would definitely put professors again on this. Uh, well, let's, uh, I guess there's a certain amount of hierarchy, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the deans, even though I guess they're technically your boss or boss, uh, our bosses, uh, they very seldom do anything without getting input uh, from their subordinates. Uh, performance orientation or the PO, uh, the extent to which a community encourages and rewards innovation, high standards and uh, performance improvement. So you can imagine without this, you might have stagnation. I mean, if there's no reason, uh, if there's no reason to go the extra mile, <laughs> why go the extra mile, uh, right? And so I guess some places you just the expectation is you do what you have to do, then and that's it. <laughs> you go home, <laughs> you do the minimum possible. Uh, versus another place where there is considerable uh, rewards uh, for high performance. I remember reading. I don't remember if it was this textbook or my 332 book, but they were. They were talking about, I think it was in 332, uh, they're saying McDonald's and fast food places, you know, they tend to get a bad rep, like as dead-end jobs. Uh, if this book was saying that's actually not true. A lot of these uh, fast food places, if you are sort of a go-getter, you could be in some kind of management position or supervisor position within a year. Uh, so there is some, you know, some rewards there for innovation performance, uh, which you might not be aware of. It's and talking about stereotypes again, you know, they, they don't have that reputation. Uh, high performance, emphasizing results more than the relationships, but the low performance might value those relationships more uh, than results. So again, it's more important. Yeah, you might not have the highest profits, the most sales, but you're not going to fire or lay people off <laughs> to get that better uh, bottom line in the uh, low performance oriented uh, culture so there's you know i'm just saying there's some positives to it as well not all just it's not like this is just all negative stuff uh future orientation uh, the degree to which cultures are willing to sacrifice current wants to achieve future needs so, 
again, Netherlands is kind of interesting. They've been sort of at the top and bottom a lot of these uh, charts. It's like they're very future oriented. It would uh, looks like Germany coming in second there. And then towards the bottom is Italy again. Italy, it seems like Italy and the Netherlands seem to be topping and bottoming <laughs> a lot of these uh, charts. So I guess they would be more concerned with what's going on now uh, versus what's going to be happening uh, five, 10 years down the road. And let's see, high future orientation, emphasizing control and planning for the future. Uh, more on intrinsic motivations. And then we get over here, and of course, most of the stuff is just the, uh, the opposite advice. Now, assertiveness deals with the level of confrontation and directness that is considered appropriate and productive. So do you want to just state the facts, <laughs> jump right to business, <laughs> uh, exert uh, your expertise, I guess, uh, versus should you be striving for more of a humble, uh, I don't want to say meek, but, uh, you know, I guess a more collaborative approach, <coughs> less uh, less uh, self-centered, more group-centric. Uh, so again, we have Germany here at the top, and uh, Japan is at the bottom on this one, or towards the low assertiveness. Let's see, where is the U.S.? Uh, USA at third spot. I don't see, uh, yeah, there's the Netherlands and Italy, so they're kind of in, still kind of on opposite ends here. But this would be uh, things, that, yeah, like a direct, unambiguous language. You know, just tell me in plain language, what are you talking about? <laughs> Get to the point, man. That'd be high assertiveness. Uh, low assertiveness, indirect, subtle language should probably be asking you more questions uh, than they would just telling you things. You know, don't you think it would be better if blah, blah, blah. Uh, view silence as communicative and respectful, and that's a low assertiveness culture. And so just because somebody's not talking doesn't mean that they're not, uh, it's not a bad thing. You know, there, it could be a sign of respect uh, versus the high assertiveness, uncomfortable with silence, uh, speaking up quickly to, to fill the silence. So again, to come back to my class experiences and seminars, I see this a lot. You know, there, there are certain students that just, they feel like every time there's a chance to talk, they need to talk. And they just dominate the discussions. And you know, they're always the, uh, the first with their hand up. And I'm always just saying, you know, please be patient. We have other students in the class. If they have a little more time, uh, they probably have great things to contribute. Uh, but they're not going to try to, uh, you know, they're not going to try to force force their way into a discussion if they don't have uh, that opportunity. You know, they're sort of waiting respectfully for the uh, opportunity uh, to voice their opinion or whatever it is they want want to say. Right? Let's see what else we have here. Uh, typically, express less emotion. And that's the low assertiveness culture. So I guess more calm, placid. Uh, versus the high assertive culture, which is typically more emotion. Right, I think you get the idea there. Uh, humane orientation. Now, the degree to which an organization or society encourages and rewards individuals for being fair, altruistic, friendly, generous, caring, and kind. Oh, boy. <laughs> I wonder where the U.S. is going to be on this. <laughs> Let's see. So apparently Japan is very humane. Uh, let's see, China, second. USA, third. Who are they put on the low humane? Uh, Germany, <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Are you telling me Germans are <laughs> completely unfair, uh, non-altruistic, and unfriendly? Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, I'm not really exactly sure how they compiled these, uh, you know, these numbers, but it is suggestive. Let's see, communication styles. So in the high humane ori oriented uh, culture, you'd express greetings, welcome, concern, appreciation in most interactions uh, versus low humane, uh, express greetings and welcome in only informal interactions. Uh, feelings are critical versus feelings are inefficient. Uh, volunteer to help others versus helping others only when asked. Let's see, smile and display other nonverbal signs of welcome infrequently. Uh, versus smile and display other nonverbal signs of welcome frequently. <laughs> like I say, you know, I would much rather be in the high humane <laughs> uh, place than the low humane uh, place. But 
So I guess what, what, what are they saying here? If you're in Germany, don't smile. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe that's true. Uh, uncertainty avoidance. Uh, how cultures socialize members to feel in uncertain, novel, surprising, or extraordinary situations. Basically, do you want to stay in your comfort zone? Do you want to get outside that comfort zone? Let's see. Apparently, in Germany, just one big <laughs> discomfort zone. <laughs> uh, where's the uh, U.S. here? USA is uh, 45. Uh, so I guess we're not quite as comfortable with uncertainty as Germany and, and China uh, would seem to uh, thrive on it, according uh, to this. I guess they, in the Netherlands, they're in third place. So. Like uh, extraordinary situations over familiar, predictable uh, patterns. So what are these communication styles appropriate here? So if you're in the high uncertainty avoidance uh, culture, you document agreements and legal contracts, uh, expect an orderly communication, meticulous records. We get over here to the low uncertainty though, and you see there's a um, uh, rely on the word of others rather than contractual arrangements. And it's pretty good sidebar in the book about this. And they got a CEO there from, um, I think he's from India. He was talking about how business is different He's got a real estate business in India. He's got some restaurants in the U.S. And he was saying that uh, in the U.S. he has everything is a contract. <laughs> like every, even like trivial business uh, uh, matters, procedures. You got all these, all the page after page of uh, legal uh, contracts. And it's annoying to him. It's inefficient because in India, with his real estate business, just a, sh a handshake is considered, you know, sufficient. Right, and there's a lot more uh, trust there uh, that that handshake will be, uh, you know, that verbal agreement's just as good as a legal contract. <laughs> Basically, I guess they don't feel like they need to drag uh, 100 lawyers into every little um, business deal. It makes me want to move to India. <laughs> See, casual communication, uh, less concerned with documentation and maintenance of the meeting records. So again, good stuff. Let's see, gender egalitarianism. Uh, this is about the uh, roles between men and women in society. This is this is probably where you see some of the biggest differences, some of the, or some of the most shocking ones. Let's see, so high gender egalitarianism. You'll see equal professional opportunities to men and women. Uh, men and women are expected to have the same communication and management styles. And you want to avoid protocols that draw attention to gender. On the other side, we've got pretty much the opposites of these. Let's see, provide more professional leadership opportunities to men. Uh, men and women will communicate in very different ways, and the protocol will uh, draw a lot of attention to gender. All right, building and maintaining cross-cultural work relationships. Establish trust and show empathy. Adopt that learner mindset we've talked about so often. Uh, build a co-culture of cooperation and innovation. So let's look at these. Perceptions of trust across cultures. Percentage of adults who agree that most people can be trusted. So if you go to China, 53% uh, of people, I guess, will think you are trustworthy. <laughs> Maybe not you, but <laughs> other people are honest. All the way down to Brazil, where I guess they think that most people are dishonest or might be lying. It's the expectation of fair play. Percentage of adults who agree that most people are fair. So you see Jap uh, Japan, 57, all the way down to Germany. What is up with Germany on these things? So Germans, uh, only 1% of Germans agree that most people are fair. Wow. USA, 49%. I'm really kind of fascinated by these tables. I, I want to see if I can figure out how they compiled that data. All right, the learner mindset. You expect that members of other cultures possess unique types of knowledge and unique approaches to problem solving that will be helpful for a shared business interest. So in other words, you don't go to another culture and start turning your nose up at everything and thinking that you're superior. Uh, that's ethnocentrism, to think that way. Uh, instead, just saying there's a different way to, to do, uh, different way people are living here, different lifestyles, different uh, attitudes, different mindsets, and uh, you could learn a lot. 
And so that should be your attitude. What, what can I learn here? Uh, <laughs> not how can I impose my way, uh, my cultural values onto this other culture? So let's see, we have a definition here of ethnocentrism. The belief that your own culture is superior, that it provides better approaches for solving work problems or dealing with work relationships and contains a better knowledge base to conceptualize work. That's <laughs> what you don't want to be. <laughs> All right, so here's some etiquette and customs in the BRIC countries that we'll cover. These are the uh, countries that are expected to be of, of the best or the highest strategic importance for business uh, during the 21st century. So basically, the countries to pay attention to, <laughs> we start with Brazil. So if you are if you have a business meeting in Brazil, you got some Brazilian colleagues there, and we, they start here with just what's acceptable chit-chat, small talk com, uh, topics. And, and they say personal topics are good, uh, soccer, uh, weather, traffic, cultural events. I said, with the exception of soccer, you know, that sounds pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty much like, you know, what you would do uh, in an American meeting. Let's see, taboo topics, uh, politics, uh, poverty, crime, security, deforestation, and corruption. Punctuality, meeting times are relaxed and often start 10 to 15 minutes late. So I guess the key there is if you have a meeting and somebody's 10 minutes late, you shouldn't get mad at them. Uh, dining, meals, lunch, and dinner, important part of building relationships. Careful attention to etiquette. Food is never touched with the hands. Begin, meal, begin the meal with a toast. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this. Sod, <laughs> sodé. <laughs> well, I wouldn't last long in Brazil. I had to learn how to how to pronounce this word. Uh, touching and proximity. Uh, frequent and extended touching. Handshakes, embraces between friends, kissing on cheeks between women as a greeting, touching arms, standing close to one another during conversation. Uh, so I think that's probably a pretty big difference. <laughs> I'm okay with a handshake. I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to be hugging all the time. Uh, touching arms, standing close to one another. So this, this last one's interesting. So you might interpret this as, well, so this person's really kind of in my space. What, are they trying to intimidate me or bully me or something? Uh, no, it's just you know, one of these uh, big cultural differences, right? What's considered uh, normal to you might be different in terms of uh, the distance you stand when you're talking to somebody. You know, I saw one example from this in one of the other classes. They're you know, talking about, uh, like, you get on a bus or you're... you're uh, yeah, there's three or four benches there. <laughs> Some uh, people will consider it extremely rude if you don't sit right next to them. Uh, you know, if you sit way, if you put, you know, if you sit uh, at a distance from them, uh, it's like you're saying, I don't like you or I don't trust you. It's kind of an insult, uh, basically. So I thought that was interesting. Like we would consider it probably more polite not to just sit right next to somebody if there's an empty seat behind them, or, let's say. Let's see, conversation style, animated, lively, expressive, lots of interruptions, <laughs> loud, spontaneous, sounds kind of fun. <laughs> uh, formal business attire is important, uh, should be stylish and fat, well, that rules me <laughs> uh, For women, dress should be feminine, uh, titles only used in formal situations, gifts are not expected on the first meeting, better alternative is to buy a meal. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of these with you. Uh, you can certainly look at these in the book, but the point is just to see how all of these differ so much. And if you were uh, striving for success in your communication methods, you'd really do yourself a great service by uh, reviewing <laughs> uh, the research. You know, what is, oh, I'm going to go to India next week. Let me uh, see. So in India, people stand closer to one another than in North America. Good to know, right? <laughs> so you can avoid a lot of awkwardness uh, or confusion if you just take some time to learn about the culture uh, uh, with, with charts like these. Anyway, let's see. Identity, identities and workplace communication. Uh, like culture on a global level, different identities can impact workplace communication. Oh, this is, now this is where we start getting into some fun stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about these generation groups. Uh, gender and other group identities. All right, so first up, we're talking about generations. 
And we've got a group called the Traditionalists, and these are people born between 1925 and 45. Uh, the boomers, or baby boomers, I typically heard them uh, referred to as, these are born between 1946 and 64. Generation X, which is by far the best generation, these guys are totally awesome. <laughs> uh, people born between 1965 and 81. Uh, generation Y, uh, 81 and 99, and then uh, Generation Z, 2000 or after. Let's take a look at some of these uh, generations and uh, their communication styles. Uh, let's see, what is this? Uh, five generations. Oh, so this is the number of, uh, of these generations in the workplace. So some of these will be, yeah, traditionalists. I guess these folks are mostly retiring or retired at this point. So you can see a very small slice there. Uh, lots, but not as many boomers. And then over to Generation X. You know, I'm trying to look at this closely. Looks like Generation Y has a little bit more than X. <laughs> so I guess Generation X is a little bit on the decline uh, already. Uh, Generation Z over here, and these are two, mostly too young to have a job yet. I guess when this table was uh, composed, but uh, the expectation is, of course, this is going to shoot up in the next uh, few years. So that gives you an idea of the the numbers. In so let's see, tips for working with different generations. Now focus on the individuals and their professional goals. Recognize the similarities across the generations. Pay attention to preferred approaches to communicating. You know, with somebody rather be uh, talked to on the phone or face to face versus a text or uh, an email, a video uh, chat. <laughs> uh, observe appropriate formality and attire. Okay, this ought to be fun. Uh, perceived strengths and weaknesses of millennials in the workplace. Uh, let's see. So we got boomers, Generation X, and Generation Y. So numbers refer to percentage of respondents who agreed the professionals of each generation <laughs> exhibited these traits. So let's see. First one is tech savviness. Boomers, 27. Uh, Generation X, 77. Generation Y, 85. So you basically see that the later generation there is a little tech savvier not surprising uh, adaptability <laughs> 36 percent <laughs> not very kind uh, generation x 67 kind of a, about the same i suppose most of these look very close Let's see if we can find a, a big difference what is this one uh, entitled and concerned primary primary i think that should be primarily about individual promotion so people that are entitled and concerned primarily about individual promotion, <laughs> Generation X, 51, Generation Y, a whopping 68%. Now, entrepreneurial, looks like Generation X gets uh, a little bump there. A brand ambassador, 65 versus uh, 67. So there you go. Uh, I don't know what generation you are, uh, but you could... You were probably thinking about that as we were going over these stats, right? And asking yourself, well, how do I, <laughs> do I fit that? Am I diverse compared to people that are significantly older? And let's see what else we have here. So, oh, some more strengths and weaknesses. And so Generation X looks a little more collaborative. Generation Y, lacking relevant experience. <laughs> oh, man. 15% <laughs> uh, versus 58%. Yeah, so I kind of wonder if some of this is just that old, you know, the kids these days kind of attitudes uh, with some of these. But uh, communication skills, what was 71, 42? <laughs> so the numbers refer to percentage of respondents who agreed the professional. Well, so you're telling me that these respondents thought that only 42% of Generation Y had good communication skills? <laughs> That's harsh. Ooh, and hard working. I don't know. Again, I'm not. Oh, we do have a note here. Let's see. Based on a 2013 survey of 1,200 professionals, survey shows younger managers rise in the ranks. I'm not quite sure how authoritative this uh, study is. The source is. <laughs> it's kind of dire, though. <laughs> he just went by this information. All right, gender and communication patterns. 
Uh, differences still exist in the way men and women communicate. <laughs> Big shocker. <laughs> Let's see. Women tend to be more relationship-oriented, collaborative, and interconnected. Men tend to be more independent, competitive, and linear in thinking. Let's see. What does this look like when we compare it across uh, different societies? Uh, we got here the men and women in individualist and collectivist cultures. So there's the, the men there, this blue line. That's the individualist cultures. Many people there. Let's see, women are in the women, individualist cultures there. This is an interesting uh, interesting chart, really. <laughs> it's from a design perspective. <laughs> and so what exactly is this telling us? Demonstrate that women tend to exhibit more collectivist relational attitudes and behaviors in collectivist and individualist societies. Now, right here we have these speech patterns associated with women. Uh, so not, they're not saying these are hardwired. I mean, this is all uh, social construction, cultural construction to some degree. Uh, but we do notice some, some patterns. Uh, women tend to ask questions more often, apologize uh, more than men, uh, sharing credit, giving feedback, avoiding verbal opposition, uh, being indirect to subordinates and, and complimenting. And of course, all this is... Uh, uh, very fluid. You know, I was looking over these lists and I realized that I, I definitely fit these speech patterns. <laughs> uh, so what is that saying? You know, clearly this is not uh, anything hardwired or tied to, to biology uh, necessarily. Let's see, tips for communicating across the genders. Uh, notice when professionals use speech patterns for task-based uh, task based versus relationship-based reasons. So again, this is that adopting that learner. Uh, learner mindset, right? Just observing, uh, purposefully and consciously adopting your own style to fit whatever situation you you find yourself in, and trying to overcome these these biases, right? <laughs> There's so many. I just think like we'll never get over some of them uh, on both sides or all sides, but to the extent you can make some difference, go for it. All right, displaying cultural intelligence with other groups. Uh, people from certain types of cultural groups include people from certain regions. You certainly see this. Uh, people from urban and suburban or rural, rural areas. Again, you can, see, you can definitely see this. Uh, ethnic groups, occupational groups, and companies. Okay, that brings us to the end. Unless I clocked in at just about an hour, which I'm happy with. <laughs> so, anyway, here's our chapter takeaways. Uh, we talked about the characteristics of cultural intelligence, why that's important, why that's valuable. All these different cultural dimensions, uh, individualism versus collectivism, egalitarianism and hierarchy, assertiveness, performance orientation, future orientation, humane orientation, uncertainty, avoidance, and gender egalitarianism. Uh, all of these things will vary from culture to culture and affect communication. Uh, key categories of business etiquette, appropriate topics. So lots of tables uh, from those uh, BRIC or BRIC countries, how the, the tremendous variation just in like what's considered appropriate small talk. Uh, what's considered a taboo topic. Uh, what about punctuality, meetings, uh, even dining? You know, it's not just the kind of food is different. If you go to India, let's say, um, but the table etiquette uh, could be completely different as well. Uh, touching, proximity, uh, this might be <laughs> alarming to you. <laughs> you know, if you don't do any research and you're just, you go to a place and you're like, why is everybody crowding me? <laughs> well, that's a cultural difference, right? Uh, how group differences affect workplace communication. All right, so that's a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this, you know, learned something from it. I'd love to ha hear from you. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot more experience than I do uh, going to other cultures, uh, dealing uh, you know, with different communication uh, situations, <laughs> whatever it might be. Love to hear from you. Uh, anyway, I'll stop it here and uh, I'll see you next time.